Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Kitty and I'm an academic doctor working in the UK. Firstly, I just want to apologise for the lack of content posting on the channel for the last couple of months. Life has been incredibly busy and hectic and part of that is because I spent a lot of time preparing for, applying for and successfully getting an academic clinical fellow job or ACF with an ST1 run through number in vascular surgery. So I am incredibly excited to start this post in the coming August after my F2 year. And given that the clinical academic pathway seems to be less widely talked about at medical school or amongst postgraduate doctors, I thought I'd take this opportunity today to talk about the academic pathway, what is the academic clinical fellow post, when and where you can apply, and briefly talk about the application process. Finally, I will round off with some frequently asked questions about the ACF as well. So firstly, about the academic pathway itself, the UK offers a parallel integrated academic training pathway for doctors who are interested in research or education. Immediately after graduating, the academic equivalent of the foundation years is the Academic or Specialised Foundation Programme or the SFP, where 25% of your training time is dedicated to academic research or education work. If you wanted to learn more about this, I have a separate video series on this topic on my channel. Following this, the Academic Clinical Fellow Post or the ACF may be taken, again with 25% of allocated academic time. The next step up would then be the Academic Clinical Lecturer or the ACL, where clinical and academic time is split 50-50. It is notable that unlike the SFP, the ACF and the ACL post can often be taken at different stages of training. Following the completion of ACL and CCT, you can then apply to be a clinician scientist as a consultant, where again you will have 50% of academic time. The academic pathway tends to last slightly longer as a result of the integrated research time. However, if at any point you decide against academia, you can always go back to the clinical training pathway and continue to conduct research on the side. So what is the ACF? For this video, we are focusing on the Academic Clinical Fellow Post or the ACF. This is an NIHR-funded research post lasting three years or up to four years for GP trainees, with 75% of the time dedicated to specialist clinical training and 25% to academic work. Over the three years, you will progress year on year pretty much at the same pace as your clinical colleagues. And what I mean by this is, if you start the ACF post at ST3, after three years you'll be an SC6, just like a clinical trainee, or if the ACF starts at ST1, after three years you'll be an ST4. Around 250 ACF posts are available across the UK every year, and they tend to be highly competitive with a quoted competition ratio between 5 to 1 or 30 to 1 depending on where you're applying. The ACF post can either be a specialty themed post, for example in cardiology or respiratory or in my case vascular surgery, or it can be aligned with an NIHR priority research theme, which addresses the broader multidisciplinary research areas such as epidemiology and public health or acute care. These competition posts will allow trainees in several different specialties to apply for the same ACF, so for example a GP trainee and an internal medicine trainee can both apply for an acute care themed post. You can view the distribution of these posts in previous years on the NIHR website. The goals of an ACF post is to provide access to master's level research training to develop research skills, provide the time to undertake research projects with guidance from an academic supervisor, provide additional funding for research projects and research courses and attending conferences. And finally, ACFs are supported through the research training fellowship application process to apply for funding to undertake a higher research degree, usually a PhD, or supported to gain a place on an educational program leading to a higher degree as well. This will usually take place straight after the ACF with time out of clinical training. Additionally, a very important point to make is that a successful ACF application will also provide you with a run-through national training number in that specialty, which is an important benefit to consider as it means that you will be able to go through the equivalent or core surgical training or IMT or whatever it is with added security of already having secured a training number rather than having to reapply at the level of ST3. So when should you apply for the ACF? Depending on the specialty, positions can begin anywhere between SD1 to SD4. This means that you can potentially apply as early as an F2 trainee like me to start the level of SD1, or at the latest as an ST3 trainee. Some ACF posts may stipulate that only trainees at a certain level can apply, so just make sure you read the small print and find this out before applying. Anecdotally, there are pros and cons to apply for an ACF post earlier on in your career versus later when you're an established registrar in training. An early application to the ACF at ST1 or CT1 or IMT1 level means that you will also get a run-through training number without needing to reapply nationally for ST3. 
And additionally, you'll be able to carry out a PhD at an earlier stage in your career, so you will not have to take time out of training later as a senior registrar, which, again, anecdotally, some people have found difficult, particularly for craft specialties like surgery. On the other hand, completing the ACF at a later stage of training might mean that you have a better idea of your clinical and research interests and you can be much more focused from the beginning. In terms of where to apply, ACF posts are advertised every year through Oriel. A full list of the available posts in different deaneries, specialties and themes are published on the NIHR website and varies year on year. The way this process works in brief terms is that the NIHR allocates a number of posts for each deanery or academic unit. The division of these posts and associated specialty of the ACF posts are then decided within the academic unit itself and variations may occur based on the posts allocated in the previous year. So for example, if cardiology has recruited two ACFs last year, they might have less slots the following year. It may also be based on the demand for the post, so for example if the department had additional research funding and research need, or if they knew that there were suitable candidates. It may also vary based on the competition or success of the applications previously, so for example if a particular specialty had a high number of high quality applicants, they may increase the slots uh, of ACF posts for this the following year. If you are interested in a particular deanery, it is therefore a good idea to get in touch with them early to see whether they will be offering a post aligned with your interests early on. In terms of the application process, the ACF applications are very individualised based on the academic unit that you are applying for. Broadly speaking, the Oreo application will consist of quantifiable evidence such as additional degrees, additional exams or qualifications like the MRCS or the MRCP exams, publications, presentations and prizes. And this is followed by a number of white space questions where you are asked to write paragraph answers in response to questions to showcase why you are a desirable candidate and expand on your academic experiences. An example of shortlisting criteria and scoring is recommended on the NIHR website, such as medical and clinical experience, relevant higher degrees, prizes, teaching experience, publications, presentations, language skills, academic experience and academic potential. A lot of these criteria can be subjective, and the desirable criteria may vary between deanery and the specific post, but you can see that some consideration is given to account for your stage of training as well. So for example, an F2 would score highly compared to an ST3 if they have the same amount of achievements. My approach to writing the white space questions were pretty identical to how I wrote them for the uh, SFP or the AFP, so I won't go into them any further here, but you can check out my previous video. Based on these, you are then shortlisted for an interview. And again, this may vary a lot based on the region and the specific post that you are applying for, but they will generally focus on critical appraisal of a paper or an abstract given to you on the day, followed by discussion, as well as general questions about academia, your CV and academic achievements, and possibly discussing any ideas or projects you would like to take forward in the ACF. I will be discussing this in more detail in another video focusing on the interview alone. After the interview, candidates are then ranked and given a job offer. In terms of benchmarking, so the idea behind this is that the ACF is a process designed to purely assess you from an academic point of view, and therefore you might need to complete the relevant clinical benchmarking in order to take up the post and the national training run-through number. This is applicable to anyone who hasn't already completed the necessary selection process for specialist training. So for example, in my case as an F2, um, to take up my ACF post as an ST1 in the coming August, I would need to complete the core surgical training interviews like any other clinical trainee as my clinical benchmarking tests to demonstrate that I am appointable clinically. Similarly, to enter ST3, I will need to complete the relevant specialty selection clinical interviews. So in this case, the ST3 selection interviews for a vascular surgery ST3 post when the time comes. The good news is that if you are successful in your ACF application with a national training number, you will only need to score the minimum amount of marks to pass the interview to be deemed appointable rather than having to rank and preference nationally at these clinical interviews. Finally, let's talk about some frequently asked questions. There are further FAQs available on the NIHR website, which I'll have linked in the description below. Firstly, do you have to have done an AFP or the SFP in order to obtain an ACF post? No, so an academic or specialised foundation post is not a prerequisite to obtaining an ACF post. However, having done the AFP or SFP is often a desirable criteria because it demonstrates that you have already been part of a competitive selection process for academic potential, you will likely have had formal training on methodology, and you can show the ability to balance clinical and academic work as part of the academic time in the AFP or SFP. Is there a requirement for additional degrees or a certain number of publications and presentations? 
No, so much like the SFP, these are not really a requirement to apply for an ACF post, but are obviously considered a desirable criteria on your application. The competition is fierce, as I said, so any of these additional items will give you points to be shortlisted and generally reflect well on the interview. Personally, I had no additional degrees when applying to the ACF, but I made up for this with my research experience and output. Can you go back to a normal clinical training pathway after three years of ACF? Yes, so following completion of the ACF, it is possible for you to go back to a pure uh, clinical training pathway as long as you can demonstrate your competencies at ARCP and you've done the necessary benchmarking um, at clinical interviews. If you meet these criteria, you'll be able to keep your national training number that you obtained uh, when you got the ACF post. Obviously, the hope at ACF selection is that these individuals will carry on to have an academic career, but we know that this is often you know, not compatible or possible or people change their mind for a variety of reasons. So it is possible. Are there other ways to do a PhD without an ACF post? Yes, so plenty of trainees take time out of training to complete a PhD or an MD, regardless of being on an academic track. So this can either be via applying for a grant or a funded PhD, similar to an ACF trainee would be encouraged to do. Or alternatively, there are so-called self-funded PhDs where um, trainees take time out of training without funding or a salary or any research costs. Um, the latter is of course much more difficult, but it is very possible. And I know that there are trainees and registrars who uh, basically split the work into a little bit of locum uh, per week to pay the salary and then use the rest of the time uh, for academic work. And that wraps up this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this useful. If you did, a thumbs up would be much appreciated and make sure you subscribe for more future content. Next, I'll be making a video on the details of the ACF application, particularly with regard to the interview in terms of my experience and some tips. I will also be covering the 2022 core surgical training application process uh, because I've also had to do this to benchmark clinically. If you have any particular questions you want me to answer, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll either try to reply directly or include this in a future video. That's it for now and take care.